So I'm just going to start off a little bit talking about thematic investing, which you could possibly argue that uh, our experts are, uh, are going to talk a little bit about in far greater depth than I ever could. I'm just going to touch on a few key themes. First of all, <clears throat> another disclaimer, please take a good, careful look at this. Perhaps the most important ones there at the bottom, uh, past performance not being a guide to future performance and, and, and forecasts are not always entirely reliable, no matter how much good faith they're given in. Uh, so that's the contents. And then so what, you know, thematic investing, uh, I've done a lot of digging around. There is no official definition. So I've had a go myself and, and you can come up with various different ones. It can be an attempt to invest according to a discipline or a factor. We're all quite familiar with factor investing. Some of the key ones being growth, income, value and momentum, even if you can argue that they themselves are perhaps a little bit artificial and, and potentially overlapping. You can argue that thematic investing is an attempt to, to capture the zeitgeist, something that's going to be hot uh, and get in early uh, and, and make some decent gains as a result. Or you can perhaps argue it's an attempt to benefit from change in an industry or sector or, or even a geography through a basket of country or companies uh, and indeed securities that are relevant to them. I, I'm certainly a great fan myself of a, of, a, of, a, of a saying, and I think it's generally worked me pretty well in my near 30 year career as a uh, fund manager, uh, sell side analyst at UBS Investment Bank, uh, journalist and, and now investment director at AJ Bell, which is that generally, it's, it's not foolproof, but generally I'd like to think that a bad stock in a good sector will tend to outperform a good stock in a bad sector. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's, let's just take a step back and let's just say, it's just hard to believe it perhaps maybe right now that the oil price is going through the roof. Well, then you would think on balance, a poor oil company would probably still outperform a really good airline, for example, uh, while oil remained very strong. So identifying that theme can help you not just pick winners, but potentially avoid losers at the same time. So I guess ultimately in terms of thematic investing, you could say it's a way of seeking, yes, superior, but risk adjusted still, total shareholder returns from a defined narrative, doing that through individual securities or actively managed funds or indeed passive funds that home in on a specially created or specific theme or index. So broad examples, well, we've got you know, two here tonight, technology and, and, and biotechnology and healthcare. We've got the little uh, green filled glass piggy there to, to signify perhaps environmental, social and governance investing themes, the dam for infrastructure in the bottom, the coins for income, and the polytunnel there for agriculture, which is a theme that people have occasionally latched onto in the past and perhaps will again in the future. Narrower themes, uh, cybercrime, there's an exchange traded fund in the US that trains, trades with a wonderful ticker of HACK, H-E-C-K. Uh, electric vehicles, there's a, there's a dedicated um, actively managed fund in the, U, in the UK that looks just at uh, companies exposed to that particular area. Cannabis has been an area of, uh, dare one say, considerable amounts of hot air over the last 12 or 18 months of various forms, but there are lots of products designed to help um, investors access cannabis funds if they, of various types if they think that's appropriate for them. Uh, cities and infrastructure. Uh, again, there are some dedicated active funds here in the UK, and I guess the, the cities one was looking to play the demographic, demographic trend of more people moving towards them in urbanisation. It'll be interesting to see if that changes in a post-COVID world and those funds reposition themselves more to the burbs or, or in a different way. Gold and precious metals are a topical one right now. And again, robotics has been a potentially, and artificial intelligence have been a very hot theme over the past two or three years in particular with dedicated products springing up to help investors access those themes again, either actively or passively. But in the end, it all comes down to performance. Here we have you classic 1960s Western fans, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And looking at performance, well, I just thought I'd sit down and just take a, you know, a fairly long-term time horizon, 10 years. And since we've got two investment trusts speaking tonight, I look specifically at investment trusts, but you could do this for ETFs, you could do it for actively managed funds. And lo and behold, without wishing to flatter our guests in any way, both of their trusts are in the top 10 global, uh, top 10 performers in investment trusts in the UK over the last decade. So, you know, it's certainly um, it's great to have them along today. And you can see some un well understood, well defined themes or narratives have shone for the last decade biotechnology, technology. Uh, Lins will train perhaps a little bit different, but much very much more in the sort of quality and growth bucket, for example. But there have been some clear thematic winners there. If you latched onto those and then picked the right manager, then you really were in clover. Uh, over the last 10 years, however, you could have got the theme wrong. Geiger counter down at the bottom there, I think is a play on uranium and nuclear power. 
which after the Fukushima disaster of 2011 in Japan, uh, hasn't worked out particularly well. And also we got one or two other things in there related to say property, local shopping REIT here in the UK, that's very problematic, I would think in a post COVID world or certainly is being viewed as such. Macau property opportunities, issues over uh, Chinese control, again, issues over, over COVID right now. And then Baker Steel resources, commodities, very hot at the turn of the decade, uh, very cold for most of the rest of it. And emerging markets have been in the doghouse, particularly Latin America there, not necessarily the fault of the fund manager, they may well have outperformed their index, but it's been pretty tough sledding to make money when the, the overall environment's been extremely difficult. So uh, again, you have to get your narrative right and your theme right, perhaps no matter how skilled the fund manager involved. So that looks at the last decade of the last year, things have flipped around a little bit, but biotech still very prominent, tech still very prominent. Uh, one or two more um, intriguing areas, Gold has sneaked back up there with gold and prospect precious metals. Global resources is, is, is back in there. And, uh, and then select Asian funds have actually done incredibly well, intriguingly. And then on the downside, uh, the, the reach for yield, the relentless quest for income has, has been very problematic in the last 12 months. A lot of specialist air funds here, such as aircraft leasing, distressed debt, property designed to try and generate yield. Things have generally come very badly unstuck and perhaps not too surprising energy has been right down there a dedicated oil and, and gas fund riverstone has come badly unstuck as the oil and gas prices have come down so if you hit the right narrative boy can it be powerful but if you hit the wrong one it, it can be extremely painful so the, the rewards are clear you can spot a potentially disruptive new trend or narrative that helps you pick winners dodge losers in the grand good sector versus bad set tradition and tech or bio and biotech prime examples they have had the odd cold spell post 2000 but they've certainly been a phenomenal pick over the last decade in a low growth low interest rate low inflation environment and i'm not going to say any more about them because we've got two expert three experts here so you can listen to the organ grinders rather than the monkey and listen to the experts rather than the jack of all trades which is me and then accessing a basket of securities through an actively or passively managed fund in this case actively managed trusts can help you mitigate risk and still get you access to the winning theme and, and again, just perhaps a slightly tap on the, the argument in favour of tech and biotech that's worked so well and in favour of growth, you can argue momentum relative to value. Even Charlie Munger, who's always been a big advocate of, of, of growth at the right price, certainly has been very dismissive of value recently. And this was his quote uh, in a recent Baxter Hathaway statement. You know, too many investors are like a bunch of cod fishermen all after the cod, after all the cod's been overfished. That's what happens to all these value investors. Maybe they should move to where the fish are. Uh, and again, that shows if you get the theme wrong or you stick to a discipline blindly, it, it can cause you considerable pain. It doesn't mean that value is not coming back, but it's been an extremely uncomfortable decade for value investors. And just examples of the rewards. Mentioned electric vehicles. Here's Tesla. Share price has gone into orbit over the last 12 months, despite a, a bit of a wobble in the spring. And the debate of 18 months ago as to whether it should or not should not raise funds, now by and large seems fairly academic. There will still be people who aren't fans of the stock out there, still worrying about the valuation. But if you'd hooked onto the EV theme and put Tesla as the cornerstone in there, you'd have obviously done pretty well. I mentioned Hack earlier on, that exchange traded fund. This has done very well. This is taking it back to its flotation date in 2014. It's pretty much doubled, which I think is a, a return that you'd take pretty happily. And I think that one looked out in a way that as soon after it launched, there was some very high profile cyber attacks on governments as well as corporations. Uh, and then bang, you know, they've been phenomenal performers for a very long period of time, but particularly over the last four or five years. And what that chart, this chart here does, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Alphabet or the G, Google uh, and Microsoft just looks at the change in market cap uh, against the change in the market cap of the S&P 500. And they have been very much the, gig, the big game in town for the past 12 to 24 months. And that shows, shows, shows that chart shows that the increase in the FANGS market caps, well, pretty much out produce all of the good news from the S&P 500 and more uh, and the percentage of the market cap of the S&P 500 is now at record high so it's been pretty hard to outperform uh, if you haven't been involved in those stocks so huge potential rewards if you spot the theme risks you know in the end stock markets yes we all love a narrative the human brain is kind of hot wired to like them but you know we're not we're not you know reading a Hans Christian Andersen novel here a, a fairy tale in the end we've got to be hard headed uh, everybody can spot a story but it's spotting the right story and also making sure that you pay a valuation that at least gives you a chance of making a return from that narrative via an individual security or basket of securities 
And there is the danger, can be the danger, that chasing themes turns into performance chasing as you lurch from one hot, pot, hot topic to the next, just as the smart money is heading out, and you get caught being dragged along with the rest of the herd, which isn't normally always a good place to be. And sometimes with Wall Street, quality control isn't great. And I think one warning sign can be sometimes where you see sudden proliferation of product, proliferation of indices. It may be that something's just becoming that little bit too fashionable for its own good in the short term. And all great themes uh, occasionally have fallow spells. So again, nothing's necessarily going to absolutely work forever, even if there are some compelling long-term stories to be found, and I'm sure we're going to hear about two later on. Uh, and this is just goes back to the you know, the copycats, whether it's Wall Street products or indeed companies. Mr. Buffett, I know that he and Mr. Munger aren't everybody's cup of tea right now and their performance has been pretty chastening over the past few years, but the great men talk a lot of sense. Their record's very good. And this great one from Buffett, first come the innovators who see the opportunities that others don't, then come the imitators who copy what the innovators have done, and then come the idiots whose avarice undoes the very innovations that are tra they're trying to use to get rich. Uh, and certainly this is where skilled fund managers will be able to <laughs> discern between the skillful innovators, the, ca the crafty imitators, and dare one say it, the idiots, and help keep you out of trouble. So things can and do go wrong with themes and narratives. I mentioned earlier on that cannabis has been a very hot theme as it's been gradually legalized in particularly the American states. But one of the first pure cannabis ETFs to launch hasn't been a terrific investment. And again, here, I think you probably need to discern between those that have got intellectual property and perhaps healthcare properties and those who are just looking to grow the stuff. I mean, forgive me for saying so, cannabis is nicknamed grass. So I don't think it's that hard to grow. And a time of limitless capital and free, pretty much free money from central banks. I don't think capital with which to grow it's going to be pretty tough to find either. So just growing the stuff, I'm not necessarily sure is the pathway to riches for all the fact that maybe a lot of people looking to, to, to get in out there. They're probably just going to end up growing you know, pretty tightly regulated watercress. So I'm not sure that's necessarily the way. But something with you know, intellectual property and healthcare properties, that may be different. So again, discerning requirements there. And just also potential risks of that danger of herd chasing or theme chasing. This is a chart from uh, Evergreen Gavcal, actually one of their ever, ever useful blogs, just showing the biggest global stocks by market cap at the end of each decade. By implication, that meant that they'd performed incredibly well in the previous 10 years or so. And just looking back, yeah, you could have enthusiastically piled into Japan in 1990 and then pretty much done your money for the next 30 years. You could have smashed into tech, media and telecoms in 2000 and had a pretty difficult next decade. You could have piled into China and mining commodity plays in 2010 and come pretty badly unstuck. So it'll be a really interesting test to see if that trend does hold in the next decade with some of the big fangs and some of the big heavy hitters in tech right now. It'll be intriguing to see if they can book this trend, which has been pretty hard to break for some time. And again, just a, a risk shipping. Intriguing right now. It's actually been very, very hot. This is an, this is not to by the, in any way to take the mickey or take uh, have some fun at the expense of the product provider, uh, who I think latched onto a potentially very interesting theme. Uh, but this is a shipping ETF. And as you can see right at the end, uh, it actually uh, ceased to trade when assets under management fell to a fairly small level at the turn of the year. And no sooner had they done that, then very large crude carrier rates went absolutely ballistic as the oil price collapsed. Uh, and people began to look to store oil anywhere they could because you know Cushing, Oklahoma was full. So they ended up having to try and stick oil in chips offshore. So just as the shipping ETF shut down, lo and behold, the shipping market turn around. So these things can also be very, very cruel. Uh, and again, therefore, timing can sometimes be extremely helpful. In terms of themes to watch going forward, it, I, I've plucked out two, neither of which will necessarily shock you. I mean, gold has just hit a new all time high. Um, the Federal Reserve will have a big influence on this uh, going forwards. Why are being people flocking to gold right now? Some treat it as an inflation hedge. Some treat it as a deflation hedge. Some treat it as a hedge against central banks and the authorities not being in control of the situation, which is maybe why some people are getting hot and bothered about it right now, as the authorities have the thankless task of trying to deal with, with, with COVID and the pandemic. You, know, you can look at the size of the Fed's balance sheet here against the gold price. And I think, you know, even if, and let's all hope, as we'll hear from Sven, there's a vaccine soon and this thing is reined in, the key question then is, well, what do the feds and the central banks do when the next quote normal recession hits? They didn't get around to stimulating, um, they didn't get around to withdrawing stimulus after the great financial crisis. They poured more on since. What comes, what, what comes around when the next recession comes? More stimulus may be what gold bugs are thinking right now. Equally, there will be people out there who take the Buffett view 
that gold is an inert, useless lump, and if you fell over it, you wouldn't know what to do with it, and it's just not worth the bother because it doesn't generate any cash. But what do generate cash are gold miners when things go well. This chart on the right-hand side looks at the 10 biggest members of the Huey Gold Bugs Index and their cash flow in aggregate since 2000. And lo and behold, not too surprising when the gold price goes through the roof, sort of the cash flow and sort of the dividend payments because they're very high fixed cost businesses. So if gold does keep running, and who knows, there might be one possible way to play it, not least because the Huey Index looks very cheap relative to gold. If pan the pandemic is reined in and a V-shaped recovery takes place and stimulus is reined in, then gold is going no place fast, I suspect. But if the Feds keep on pouring the money and rates stay lower for a long time and people get more and more worried about debasement of currency, it might be something that for people to think about. The other one is renewables. Nothing shocking there. I read a blog today that I think America is burning less coal now than it did in 1973. The UK now gets, I think, the majority of its energy from renewables and again hasn't burned any coal for much of this year. And so renewables, infrastructure plays, I've got several advantages. They can be yield stocks because a lot of them are utilities. They are regulated, so at least you pretty much know what your cash flows are coming over a regulated cycle. Some of the returns can be index linked. So again, if you think that inflation is coming around the corner because the authorities have overdone it on the money printing, they are another option, particularly at the time when property is probably in a lot of investors' doghouse right now. If people are looking for an alternative to equities and bonds, property was very much probably near the top of the list right now. In a post-COVID world, with people looking at office space perhaps not being used, or with people looking at you know the, the added pressure on high street and physical bricks and mortar shops, Property may be coming under more question, maybe infrastructure that taps into a lot of themes like property, index link returns, income, maybe one thing that could become more and more up on people's horizons. And although you still get share price volatility, as you've seen here with Greencoat UK Wind Investment Trust here in the UK, uh, the company's net asset value has come down a little bit, but its dividends have been paid and in fact increased, and the shares are up over a 12 month view, so they're actually re so the stock has actually been re rated, or the trust assets has actually been re rated. So this, again, may be a narrative and a theme to watch going forward. So to conclude, thematic investing can be phenomenally powerful, but you still need to make sure as an investor that your selections, your themes, your narratives and your fund managers fit with your overall strategy, time horizon, target returns and appetite for risk. Probably do need to be a bit careful of performance chasing. Uh, as Jim Rogers once said, nearly every time I strayed away from the herd, I've made a lot of money. So wandering away from the action can be the new action. So certainly getting in before the crowd can be pretty powerful and being being very wary of fads, products and index proliferation might be helpful and valuation probably will still have a role to play. But of course, it never matters until it does. And momentum can be a fantastically powerful thing. So that's it from me. 